Alrighty, hello every folks, and good morning. Welcome to a, uh, well, quick discussion on quality of life features and improvements that Reborn made. Because uh, oftentimes we'll allude to sort of a general thing over, uh, just kind of various uh, quality of life things that got improved, while not really getting into the specifics that much. Uh, so that's what I wanted to do here today. I'm um, just kind of go over a list uh, that I'd made of just over a hundred random little improvements that usually won't really stick out that much on a list if you don't know what you're looking for. Um, just for the sake of context, because, uh, uh, again, I'm always referring to this stuff in kind of vague terms and never really get into specifics. So, anyway, go ahead and, uh, as they say, go grab yourself some coffee or whatnot, because uh, it's going to be a bit of a long one. Um, so these are just the first 100 plus that I came up with. I'm sure there's more that I'm missing, but uh, as is usual, I just kind of got inspired one day to sit down and just started making a list. So let's get to it here. So first and foremost, kind of a minor one, uh, but the dialogue skip extension. So for those that don't know, uh, when a named character gets knocked out and they're about to do their big speech, um, if they start their speech, they'll uh, they'll essentially interrupt you from using your cutscene skip to skip them. However, uh, there's a brief window right after they end up uh, getting to the bottom of their health, uh, where essentially you can hit start and skip their escape speech. This is um this is something of a speedrun trick uh, that was around since the PSP version. However, the window in the PSP version was extremely precise. Um, like you had to really be on the ball to get it. This time around, it's actually been extended by about a second or so, making it far easier to utilize uh, regularly. I'm not sure how or why specifically that got extended, um, but either way, it's a nice little quality of life feature that you don't see brought up that often. All right, second thing is uh, going to be recruitable zombies. So zombies technically have always been recruitable in some way. Well, except for the SNES version where you could recruit skeletons, but the zombies were just too stubborn to ever join you. However, you needed a necromancer back in PSP in order to recruit a zombie. Um, so this time around, uh, because zombies are technically just people afflicted with the zombie status, uh, they're still willing to actually talk with you, meaning that you can actually get a few zombies early on, uh, which is a nice little uh, kind of cheeky nod to the fact that many people used to recruit skeletons back in the SNES version. Um, so so in PSP, you basically could not get undead units until, uh, well, at, at the very earliest, you could get some undead monsters um, in uh, in Chapter 2, uh, where you could get uh, something like the undead octopus, as well as the uh, undead cyclops, which is funny, because the undead cyclops is a really potentially useful unit. They moved it. It actually got moved from Farampa over to the, uh, the start of the Hanging Gardens, where he shows up there, instead of the previous Hydra that was there. It's a very oddly specific change, but I know I personally always love to go in for that Cyclops, so it's just funny that it's there. Anyway, so uh, so yeah, uh, that guy got moved over there, but you can recruit zombies this time around, uh, essentially for, uh, well, just having yourself some zombies early on. Uh, back in SNES, it was, there were no limitations on who could recruit what, uh, unless they were completely unrecruitable, but it would never tell you. Um, so uh, this led to people uh, essentially recruiting uh, skeletons and just using those extensively. This time around, you do the same thing with, uh, with those zombies. Um, okay, next is going to be sound effects levels, and that's actually one of those things they are looking at right now. You're listening to the music from the game, but not the sound effects. Uh, there's a lot of customization features in the sound menu that allows you to customize when and how sounds are currently appearing. So, for example, if you wanted to listen to the music while you were going and doing some uh, work on your computer or whatever and wanted to auto-grind San Bronza uh, in the late game, you can absolutely do that. Uh, so that's, again, exactly what we're doing right now. If you wanted to leave the sound effects on but not the voices, or if you wanted to listen for voice prompts uh, to make sure that you're not uh, missing some certain dialogue or what have you, all of those are options that you can turn on and off in your sound menu. Um, again, oddly specific, but you know exactly that uh, those were there for specific reasons. All right. Uh, next is going to be the Palace of the Dead shortcuts. So this is, again, in the oddly specific category. So the Palace of the Dead uh, has several different shortcuts that, uh, that you can unlock. Uh, not really, like, stuff that you walk through, but the Palace of the Dead guidebooks. Now, these are something that technically were always there since uh, PSP. However, uh, if you went, for example, into CODA after completing uh, uh, Chapter 4, uh, Palace of the Dead, you unlocked the uh, the shortcut books, but you couldn't use them because Roderick's uh, cutscenes would block them. So, essentially, you had these guidebooks, but you couldn't really use them until you'd already completed Palace of the Dead twice. And if you accidentally reset your timeline, well, I got some bad news for you. This time around, it will just adjust for your current world state and just let you use your books right away. So that's a very, uh, very useful thing. It's definitely made uh, navigating around the late game a lot easier. 
All right, next on the list is the crafting rework. Uh, so the uh, the crafting system got a total overhaul in Reborn, uh, where it ended up fixing a lot of the issues from before. Um, some of this stuff, I bl yeah, some of this stuff actually will get its own uh, category later on down the road. But uh, the PSP system uh, was attempting to do, you know, the crafting. All right, sorry for the uh, brief pause there. Uh, one of the dogs uh, was getting a little barky in the background. Any darn ways. Uh, so, back to the crafting system. So, the original crafting system was well-intentioned and trying to add a lot of cool ideas. Uh, trying to give you a reason to go explore the outer reaches of the world. Trying to give you a reason to have equipment upgrades. Uh, trying to make you think about uh, some unusual things that maybe you wouldn't normally, you know, think about in a conventional sense. Like using your shields for status immunities and things like that. Um, which is uh, which is interesting, <laughs> because this version ended up changing a lot of those systems um, to specifically not need a lot of those things that the original crafting system was trying to solve. So this is actually going a little bit off track here, but um, like when it comes to the shields in particular, uh, I'll cover this in the shields video, whether this comes out before or after. Um, but in that uh, shields video, I was mentioning that uh, when it comes to the debuffs and things, uh, specifically the shields were given debuff immunities in that version to try and address their unbelievable prevalence. Like, they were still even way back when, a decade earlier, they were trying to set up this thing where the player had the strategic advantage and the AI had the stats advantage. Then partway through forgot and just gave the AI, they gave the player all of the advantages. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway... Uh, so, as far as all that stuff went, you had a resistance bonus that would show up on your gear, and that was the stuff that the AI would use. So, like, you had a resistance to, uh, to silence over on your shield, and you'd see the AI running resist silence. You could simply run to the store, give it a quick little uh, upgrade, sprinkle some anti-silence juice on there, and now you are permanently immune to silence. Um, again, it, it constantly had this question of, this is such a cheap upgrade, uh, why is everyone not using this? <laughs> um, because it was all just available right from the standard chop, you know? Either way, led to a lot of question marks. So this time around, those shields are more for uh, just kind of tailoring your defense between your frontliners and potentially giving you some endgame options uh, later uh, when it comes to those other shields. But overall, the, uh, the system was reworked uh, so that you're not sitting there... Uh, going and crafting things one at a time. Uh, you don't. Uh, the animation uh, was sped up, so you're not sitting there for absolutely ages trying to wait for it all to happen. Um, and additionally, uh, when it came to your crafting options, you had pages that you could go through to see what you were crafting to begin with, because there just wasn't that information a lot of the times in the PSP version. Like again, I, I will note a lot of things that have improved since then. I just want to reiterate that I respect and love the hell out of the PSP version, but oh my goodness, there were a lot of things that were uh, that had issues. <laughs> so, uh, so anyways, uh, let's carry on here. So yeah, as far as the crafting rework, I'm pretty sure most can agree that yeah, it, it's pretty much a straight like vertical positive move on that one. Um, okay, the crafting library. Uh, so this is what uh, what I call the uh, beginning of Palace of the Dead. So uh, floors uh, like 20 to 30 approximately. Um, there previously were crafting books scattered about all over the place in really, really, really random locations. Um, and frankly, unless you had a guide, there was very little reason that you'd potentially go look for, let's say, the arm guard in Sheridian off some random, I think, like, skeleton or something it was, uh, over in, uh, in Pirate's Graveyard. Or there was, uh, uh there was the, uh, the, the, uh, spear, axe, and, uh, uh, whatever the other one was. Uh, that showed up on one uh, uh, one rune fencer hawkman that didn't even spawn most of the time in uh, Farampa Wildwood, uh, over at that uh, the river crossing map, um, or in um, uh, or you had the bow that was from uh, from one archer uh, that again would rarely spawn over in um, in Farampa Wildwood, uh, but point being, they were scattered about all over the place, and in most cases, it didn't really make a whole lot of sense why they were there. It was just kind of that MMO kind of thing that they were doing at the time, um, where they specifically wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, th there was just some content everywhere without really necessarily considering why it would be there in the first place. Again, for the most part, though, it was really, really uh, cool as far as its locations, but... I mean, like, when, when we're talking about super random drops, like one random golem just having the no-toss encased inside of it, and you have to exercise this golem, and it's a rare spawn, like, 90 floors into Palace of the Dead, can you imagine how pissed off you'd be that you just finished Palace of the Dead and you missed it that close to the end, and for that matter, you don't even know that you missed it, the guy might have never even spawned. Like, a lot of those things were 
I believe the uh, uh, the uh, the TV tropes version is uh, guide dang it. So <laughs> uh, that seems to describe it pretty darn well. Anyway. Uh, so as far as those drops, uh, floors 20 to 30 uh, in Palace of the Dead will absolutely shower you in crafting recipes. So all of those miscellaneous crafting recipes that are pretty vital for a lot of endgame builds, um, they are just all there in one location, just like, here you go, just go absolutely FBI raid the, uh, the friggin' Palace of the Dead, and this whole library is just gonna be full of all the crafting books. Um, it's not going to be all of them, mind you, but it is going to be a huge chunk of the kinds of stuff that you need to open up uh, the, uh, the end of uh, end of the game for you. Um, the super advanced stuff is still going to be uh, off in places like the uh, the final bosses of the um, uh, of the uh, elemental temples and such, uh, who previously only had a chance to drop those books and they would only drop at certain level ranges, which is just mean. Um, but then uh, then yeah, in reborn they just said, okay, fine, you just get your stuff. <laughs> like you beat the boss, you get your stuff. It's gonna happen every time. Um, all right, so uh, let's keep going. Uh, so the shop and news notifications, uh, this is going to be really useful for folks that did a lot of playthroughs, uh, just kind of generally reminding you when there's a, uh, a new thing available at the shop or when there's new notifications in the Warren Report. Um, it's a very useful thing that I'm honestly amazed they didn't include back in the PSP version because it's like something that's pretty standard for a game since a long time ago. I mean, I remember even way back, uh, like playing Last Raven back on the PS2, I remember the, the notifications being standard was just a thing. Um, so, e either way, I'm a little bit surprised they didn't include that in the first place. Uh, but let's continue on here. Uh, crystals uh, limiting crafting instead of uh, being a loop. So, I really personally love the way that they redid crystals. So, the the, uh, the crystals ore is something that you used to be able to craft infinitely back in PSP. Uh, it's essentially an item that was used to make orbs and shots. I believe I may have mentioned this in another video as well. Um, but when it comes to those orbs and shots and things, uh, you are given a chance to fail. Uh, so this new crafting system, there is no chance to fail uh, in there, you just make the thing. Um, in the old version, they tried to balance it all out by giving you a chance to fail and then trying to make it scale off of your, um, uh, off of your party stats. So like the highest stats of everyone in your party were taken into consideration when going and uh, uh, determining these drop odds, which meant that over time you ended up getting better and better odds of making these things. In a game that you can save in any state of the game at any time. Yeah. <laughs> so there wasn't really a whole lot of point to the system. It was just kind of annoying. Um, anyway. So, uh, oh, I believe the AI is about to let somebody die. That's a bit of a bummer. Eh, this map loves to do that. Oh, well, moving on. Um, so, yeah, uh, so the way that crafting was redone is that uh, they will, uh, is that uh, you'll end up um, uh, getting these uh, these crystal, uh, crystallis ore uh, when you're going and exploring these far out areas. So instead of being the crafting books that you get there, instead of being, you know, oddly specific drops you get in oddly specific places, you're given a, a steady uh, kind of flow of these advanced crafting materials that you get from exploring these areas. Um, essentially being a sort of currency to a lot of your later game crafting uh, type of tools, uh, which ends up feeling really good because you're, you know that you're getting at least something from going there, even if you're not necessarily getting the super special drops you're looking for, you may still be able to uh, go and complete part of your uh, kind of uh, collection log there, uh, courtesy of the types of items that you're getting. So that kind of stuff uh, feels pretty solid. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, it, getting those uh, those crystals as a currency meant that uh, if you were making endgame weapons or stuff like that, which now they're used as a currency for making those weapons, you're not just strictly upgrading in a lot of cases. Like for example, you don't uh, upgrade the um, uh, you don't upgrade the uh, elemental bows after already finding an elemental bow. Instead, you get your uh, uh, you get your crescents, which are far more common. You use some of these crystals on there, and you make them fire, uh, and then you go and combine them in with a. Um, uh, with a few other bits and pieces to go make your other elemental short bows. Man, the AI just absolutely let everybody die this time, didn't they? Did we even get any drops? I don't even know if we got any drops. Whatever, we'll see if we're resetting this map. Because um, there are specific drops that I was going for here. The casualties I'm less concerned about, but I want my dang drops. All right. Uh, and anyway, so the infinite money cheese is not a pain in the ass. So going back to the previous uh, crystal thing. So 
There was an infinite money trick in every one of these to some degree. The PSP version involved crafting orbs endlessly using those crystal ores, uh, which meant that you were constantly rolling for a 90%, 90%, 90% to get those uh, specific things. Then you went back and crafted several things that couldn't fail in order to get all the backup materials so that you could take all of your crystals and then all of your uh, all of your balder stuff, but then your balder stuff that was also made into other crystals to then roll for a 60 something percent chance to go get a hold of a um, uh, to go get a hold of an orb. And then you would go and sell that orb for like 10 grand. Do not dwell on my passage, okay. I go on ahead. Um yeah, probably Bayon. I mean, realistically speaking, um, I'm not seeing a whole lot of uh, reason to not restart this map because we never got the thing I was looking for. Anyway, uh, let's see. Um, so yeah, the infinite money cheese in this one is just simply uh, you go and you make blowguns and you make more blowguns. It's honestly yeah, a lot less annoying. So if somebody needs to use the infinite money cheese for a sort of pseudo easy mode, it's still not going to be easy mode, but whatever, it might help. Um, in those particular situations, you have something that uh, you could potentially use. All right. Uh, well, I got several copies of Escalating Senate. I guess that's something. Uh, did we get the thing, though? No. Well, that, that sucked. All righty, back to it we go. So we took some casualties, and we got right back up on our feet. Uh, we got uh, more people in the background. That's what our extra party slots are for. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the next thing, uh, which is going to be uh, Deneb's Recruitment. Uh, so Deneb's Recruitment is one that's always kind of been a bit of a inside joke uh, for the series, uh, where no matter where you're trying to recruit her, it is usually going to be terrifyingly expensive and also usually questionable as far as whether it'll be worth it, but usually we all do it all the same. So. You know, whether it was uh, uh, going after the uh, the bows and stuff uh, back in March of the Black Queen, uh, essentially being forced to take a massive reputation loss, as well as spending a lot of money on an item, as well as also just spending a, a whole lot of time going back and forth to get her, only to just uh, get uh, friend-zoned and denied in the end anyway, <laughs> uh, or, uh, uh, or being forced to spend extraordinary amounts of money in a lot of other cases. Um, Tactics Ogre's version was to make you uh, go get a whole bunch of of, um, of, uh, of glass pumpkins, uh, which are her favorite trinkets. Uh, you had to get 30 of them back in uh, uh, PSP, which was just kind of cruel, to be honest. Um, for the sake of reference, uh, those uh, those particular uh, items there, um, they're something that dropped uh, very infrequently from fairies in Palace of the Dead. And by very infrequently, I mean like, I would say it's probably something like, I don't know, 5% something drop, whatever. And you had to get 30 of them and then sell them to her shop for five bucks each. <laughs> it was um, not hinted at anywhere uh, outside of the guide. Um, there were no in-game hints whatsoever, aside from the fact that she likes pumpkins, uh, that you would ever try to do this. So it was a really bizarre um, kind of recruitment thing. And on top of that, you had to recruit of three of every dragon, including the, the, uh, the Hydra. Um, and then, uh, and after that, you would have another side quest, and then you would be able to recruit her. Technically speaking, all you needed was the, um, uh, the, uh, what's it, uh, dragons and such, uh, to actually recruit her. The pumpkin thing was to get a hold of her unique class. So anyways, point being, uh, it was a bit of a, bit of a long-winded thing. Now, this time around, it's actually been made a lot easier. You only need to, uh, get a hold of one of each dragon in order to recruit her. You still need the Hydra, but those are a lot easier to get. Um, seeing as most side areas are just far more accessible at this point, uh, there's really a lot less, uh, song and dance in terms of going into every single one of them. Um, but on top of this... Uh, the, her actual requirement uh, for her uh, class has switched from those glass pumpkins uh, over to um, uh, three uh, relic improvements. So uh, essentially, once uh, her shop opens up, that's around the same time that you get relics, and realistically, you're probably going to be improving your relics anyway. So while the dragon thing is, in most cases, not going to be super intuitive, uh, she is going to... Uh, you know, to be one of the potential sources of it uh, being there. So there is actually a non-zero chance that you might actually uh, encounter her on accident, which is kind of amazing. Um, but yeah, you only need to uh, get uh, one of each dragon this time around, so that is a massive improvement. Anyway, 
Uh, this is actually pretty similar to the way that uh, the uh, One Vision mod actually ended up handling changing her recruitments, uh, since there were certain things that the system would just not accept being changed. Um, so in their particular case, they similarly uh, had the orbs as something that uh, you only needed one uh, dragon each for, and uh, they changed it so that the glass pumpkins were a lot easier to get a hold of. Uh, like Not only were there plot drops, but there were also uh, uh, cases where you would go and get them. Um, uh, essentially, you could go and farm certain uh, uh, certain recruitable beasts, uh, like Cyclopes, uh, in order to get multiple pumpkins at the shop. Um, so either way, let's go ahead and continue on here. Uh, so the... Sh oh, the shop and news notification. Okay, I already... Uh, okay, I must have skipped that one the first time then. Alright, let's try explaining that one again. Uh, so, uh, drops from challenges instead of steel. So... Uh, drops, uh, or there's specific drops for specific items that uh, used to be something that you would specifically want to go and try to steal before, like getting uh, early class marks or what have you. Uh, like, for example, with um, uh, in the case of Osmo, one of the most annoying examples I can think of is that uh, if you're if you're not uh, in New Game Plus, if you wanted to get more Night Commander marks for her, there's a pretty decent chance that you may want to consider, let's say, going and uh, uh, tracking down one random fight in one specific uh, uh, weather condition in order to uh, potentially get a uh, rare chance of getting one of those class marks if your ranks if you've already essentially used steel several uh, hundred times in order to rank it up like th there were a lot of very oddly specific uh, class mark things or crafting materials or whatever else um, that would come from the not exclusively from but uh, be uh, one of the reasons that somebody would ever bother using a skill like steel back in the PSP version so that was a little bit on the annoying side, um, to uh, to be completely honest. Um, so instead, what they did this time around is they did this whole challenge system. And in most cases, it was stuff that you probably would do anyway. Like, realistically, yeah, you're probably picking up a buff card. Realistically, you're going to be able to hit an attack with 100% accuracy. But it's just giving you this little trickle of extra items every now and then that's going to be pretty handy to have. Anyway, uh, so personally, I think the challenge system was just a better way of doing it because it just tells you up front, like, okay, if you bring this class, it's, you know, good things are going to happen. If you decide to go bring in, you know, XYZ random thing over here, then, you know, good things are going to happen. If you if you bring uh, Kashua uh, with, uh, like, if you specifically bring her as one of her downgraded classes to this particular fight... We'll give you the upgraded version. How does that sound? Like, uh, that particular one, I really love. The, I mean, it's not going to be universal across the board that they're all bangers, but as far as uh, the ones that really uh, do hit different, um, there are certain ones that were just really solid. Again, the Dark Priest class mark is just a cool way that they uh, they, they implemented that one. Like, you would have just gotten uh, gotten uh, access to that class again. Uh, you would have uh, potentially, if you have uh, been through the woods, you would have potentially gotten drops for that particular uh, class before. So there's a pretty okay chance that you actually would be able to, you know, go and, uh, go and get that Dark Priest without going and doing a whole song and dance of looking up uh, stuff on the wiki. Um, so, uh, anyway. Uh, so yeah, really uh, good stuff there as far as I'm concerned. Next up, uh, so mini bosses for perfect play. Uh, there are several new mini bosses that got added to Palace of the Dead. I'm pretty sure most folks know about these, uh, but those are going to be your uh, your Hobram and uh, Aerosol ones. I believe there's two different versions of uh, Hobram there as well, uh, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. But if you play through POTD perfectly, uh, you get new mini bosses, and they will drop rare uh, crafting components for you. Um, it's funny because uh, Hobram even has a unique version of his petrification spell. To this day, I have asked, I think, like, three separate uh, times uh, whether somebody would look into whether or not it actually can be used. Like, as far as debuff spells go, it's weird that he has a unique version um, that is specifically Petrofog back from the PSP uh, rather than the usual Petrification spell. Um, but he always attacks with his Throwing Rocks. Uh, his skills are insanely... Er, sorry, his stats are insanely high. So he always just throws uh, throwing rocks to kill people. Um, so I don't know if it actually works. Um, anyway, it's just kind of neat. All right, deployment extensions. So a lot of maps got extensions to their deploy limits. Uh, so probably the most prominent example. Uh, in, in PSP, you would regularly do this thing where you would go and train with seven people in Tyne Mouth Hill. That was the most common training spot. 
And what would happen immediately as you went into Tynemouth Hill? Your deploy limit was six. And it was kind of annoying, because then you had one bench warmer uh, that was always just kind of sitting off the party, and then you had to go bring him back up, and so you're swapping somebody else out, and then, you, like, you know that all of a sudden everybody's not even anymore, which doesn't really matter in the long run, but still, it's a minor annoyance, you know? Um, not to mention, it was weirdly difficult to, uh, of a uh, fight uh, with only six people. I'm really not sure why they made it only six. Um, either way, that fight was largely left the same, but you can now send in eight. Uh, this time around, so maybe they were trying to bump it up by one and just hit the wrong button or something, who knows. Okay, uh, so let's see, no finishers or dedicated debuffs for the uh, AI. Okay, so this is an interesting side grade here. So this is more contextual, uh, because back in PSP, the AI was given full access to any finishers that they would have already unlocked, uh, everybody had that, and additionally, uh, when it came to the AI, they would love to spam their debuffs. Um, again, nowhere more so than the Japanese version, but sweet lord, they just loved them some debuffs. Um, like, it was a pretty regular thing that uh, you would uh, you would see uh, your entire team getting paralyzed every now and then. Um, so, either way, that really, really, really slowed things down. Now, whether or not it's a good or bad thing, like, personally, I, I would have uh, would have liked to see the AI come in and occasionally using, you know, debuffs in the later game where fights are already pretty freaking long and that's inescapable. Um, but they actually still use debuffs, is the thing. It's an interesting recontextualization of what was already there. Right, let's go ahead and ignore the casualties and go ahead and move on to the next fight here real quick. Anyway, uh, who died? People died. I think I, uh, I think my long-term Valk died. Um, I have no idea. Either way, I'm not even getting any of these drops, so there's a non-zero chance I'm just gonna ditch this particular, uh, run through, uh, San Bronze and go back and redo it. Any darn ways. Uh, so yeah, the AI would constantly use their finishers, the, um... Uh, the, uh, the AI would constantly use their debuffs. Now, again, in and of itself, this is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, again, look at the One Vision mod for signs of how it can definitely be a fantastic thing. But, in the context of the PSP version, it was a bit of an issue because it really, really, really slowed things down. Um, and not to mention, in many cases, it was, it was a sort of fight between several things that were already kind of doing fine on their own, if, it, if that makes sense. Uh, where effectively you constantly had this war between strengthen and fortify to determine who would go one way or another. And so they just replaced it with the buff cards of like, okay, now you know which way it's going to go one way or the other. <laughs> Whoever has that one is the one that's technically uh, getting the uh, higher damage cap, okay? There you go, done deal. Anyway, so as far as the no finishers or, uh, or uh, uh, dedicated debuffs, so the debuffs will still come from monsters. So like you can still use your spell debuffs just fine, but from the AI, they will be able to essentially telegraph those attacks now, courtesy of those monster units. So if somebody, for example, is complaining about the fact that their entire team got paralyzed, you can simply say, hey, dumbass, get away from that Cyclops. Or hey, everyone is, uh, is poisoned. Well, in this case, it's courtesy of an angel that just had a, you know, war crime in their pocket. But uh, in the case of, um, uh, in the, uh, in most cases, it's probably going to be from a Hydra or it's going to be from a ninja uh, that's going and firing poison arrows at people. Which, as a bit of a uh, side note here, the, uh, the ninjas will actually make more regular use of stuff like their poison arrows. Anyway, so uh, the uh, the finisher side of this though uh, is kind of a, kind of a interesting side grade in and of itself. See, you might be thinking like, wait a minute, would that mean the AI is nerfed and they are stupid and I don't get to feel like a big brain for beating it? Well, no, because the AI gets the stat advantage. The reason that the finisher thing matters is especially in the side areas like San Bronza and Palace of the Dead. So for anyone that's ever played the original version on PSP, there. You will remember those moments uh, when there's a random AI or something just hanging out on a ledge somewhere that you can't reach, and that guy's just spamming a bunch of random ranged finishers that you can't uh, go do anything about until your ranged units get over there. It was pretty frickin' annoying. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of cases where the AI would just simply outnumber you to a pretty ridiculous degree, they'll have several units that are kinda just hiding in a monster closet somewhere, and then you randomly end up getting rushed by a bunch of finishers at long range at once, and it was you know, kind of a pain in the neck. 
So this is why I believe uh, there's several uh, uh, several cases throughout the game where, like, let's say the enemy units will just be told to attack you normally instead of flooding you with finishers, um, simply because it will make better use of the systems at hand here. Because uh, if, for example, you're doing no basic attacks, then your Swordmaster isn't uh, going to get to show off their preempt abilities, uh, or your people won't be able to use their parry skills, or they won't be able to use their counterattacks or anything like that. This way, it's a lot more fun, uh, so they will just generally do basic attacks more often. Uh, the AI will essentially deadbrain you like many RPG players like to deadbrain the AI. Um, so yeah, it's nice. And I know for a fact that it's a definite uh, intentional decision, because you can definitely see those cases where they specifically left one or two finishers on their list, uh, just, uh, you know, just uh, to uh, kind of let you know that, uh, you know, that this is intentional right here. All right, next is the Elemental Shortbows. Uh, so these are a fun little uh, little quirky weapon um, where uh, the uh, the Elemental Bows back in PSP were a bit redundant. Uh, you essentially had the crap version, and then you went and you upgraded it into the good version with something like 30 to 40% uh, odds of success, and then you re reload it several times because you're not about to go redo that grind for that bow. Um, so, yeah, that's, you know, that's a bit of a thing. So they, they changed it so that there's elemental shortbows this time. So there are bow guns and shortbows that generally were kind of underserved uh, back, in, um, uh, back in PSP there, which is funny because technically speaking, the Damascus Crossbow Plus One, in my opinion, is bar none the strongest weapon in Tactics Ogre PSP. Um, and this is courtesy of the fact that you could essentially run a defensive build that's immune to basically every debuff, with a crossbow plus one, um, and a tactician. And all they would have to do is run forward and just charge up Death Whale. Just like tanking everything, charging up Death Whale. Uh, the uh, kind of ultimate uh, multiplayer team that I was putting together a while ago was pretty much nothing but uh, 11 generic um, uh, eleven generic uh, knights with Damascus crossbows, um, as well as uh, one lord backing them up. Like, <laughs> uh, to this day, nothing has actually managed to kill that. Um, like, it was really boring, but uh, ridiculously effective. So, point being, uh, the shortbows, though, were pretty underserved. So, the Damascus crossbow is still pretty darn strong, being able to uh, potentially uh, go and uh, find ways to get past defenses, and uh, would still be able to one-shot stuff with Death Whale. But when it came to the shortbows, they they were lacking much of anything. Like, you could use them for a stunning effect, you could use them with the uh, uh, trick arrows from the ninja and stuff like that, but by themselves they weren't terribly impressive. So the elemental shortbows are now an offhand option that will give a counterattack to whoever uh, uses it in their offhand. So if you wanted your one-handed weapons and your counterattack, so your parry and your counter at the same time, they're there for that option. If you wanted longbow range in your offhand weapon, you have it. If you wanted to have elemental uh, weapons that uh, could be combined with a shield, you have it. If you wanted uh, uh, light, uh, cro or uh, sorry, uh, light longbows that you could equip on all of your uh, other types of units, you have them there. Uh, they're there for uh, for finish coverage, they're there for just having a ranged attack to punish broken defense, or if you want to use uh, critical setups to go knock that guy back over there, or if you wanted to be able to switch to multiple elements and just equip two different bows on the same archer. All of those options are there for you. Um, so it's a very interesting tool in terms of your strategic options, so either way, I love the way that they did that. That right there also is why uh, Death Whale is freaking ridiculous. <laughs> because uh, he's not even upgraded in any way right now, and he just went and nearly one-shot a guy. All right. I should point out, uh, Death Whale, before somebody compares the two, uh, Death Whale is dramatically cheaper in this version. It was pretty expensive in PSP, and you still could, uh, uh, could basically spam it to deletion. Alright, debuff weapons got improved! As you'll see, we have several debuff weapons on this team right now. Uh, debuff weapons, in general, don't have to penetrate armor as much uh, this time around. Uh, they were either given direct uh, improvements to their attack score, uh, and or uh, could be... Uh, just had generally more forgiveness in terms of what kind of character would be able to make them work. Um, you used to have to have a nearly kind of like maxed out skill character, and they still might plink off in the endgame. Um, so, it's nice to see debuff weapons actually lasting throughout the entire game. It's just great to see them uh, having that uh, kind of longevity to them. Uh, they're some of my favorite things. Uh, it's one of the reasons that it's really fun to play One Vision, because they basically changed every weapon to a debuff weapon. Um, so while it would be cool to see the AI get them in this one, this that wasn't really the tone that they were going for. Uh, so either way, those debuff weapons are absolutely a game changer, and it's great to see them not start sucking in Chapter 3, and then just losing all relevance by the time you get to uh, Coda. Um, Alright, the party limit was doubled, that one's pretty obvious, uh, went from 50 to 100. 
Uh, let's see, the MP rework for more uh, versatility, TP functionality. So, a combination of uh, the old TP system and MP system. They did the old TP tricks, so just turning it into an overdrive bar. Uh, essentially, you get hit, uh, you end up uh, getting a little bit of MP. You, uh, you do hits, you get a little bit of MP. And frankly, it should have been this from the beginning. As much as I love the action system and stuff like that, uh, the action skills are amazing, but uh, there was little reason to do both TP and MP back in PSP. We like the letter P around here. Um, anyway, uh, in that particular system, uh, there was a bit of an annoyance because there were, well, frankly, a lot of skills that would exclusively affect something like MP or exclusively affect something like TP. And in many cases, either a class didn't really have a whole lot of use for TP uh, in the case of casters, or they were a uh, uh, they were a fighter that didn't have MP at all. So you basically were lo uh, losing a lot of your functionality on your oddly specific abilities. Um, so this is why, for example, uh, one of the ones that I like to mention got twisted around uh, was like the Juggernaut's Threaten ability, which went from being completely worthless in the old context to, with basically no changes, being incredible in this one. Um, so either way, it, uh, it just allows for more versatility in general, uh, it means that more skills can affect more things, and it means that uh, like more uh, support abilities can potentially be used to support more types of units, uh, casters can go use their sticks to go charge up their dragons and stuff like that. It's just a really, uh, a really elegant way to rework it. Okay, uh, drops are not near cliffs. Uh, this is, again, kind of oddly specific, and yes, technically there's drops all over the place, but uh, specifically the one that comes to mind is that one necromancer in Palace of the Dead that would drop a Daedalus rack uh, back in PSP. Because your first thing is, wow, that is the squishiest unit in front of me, pew pew, and then he falls off the cliff and you uh, lost your Daedalus rack, and then you remember two maps later and you're like, shit, I can't believe I forgot that again. Um, so yeah, that kind of stuff kind of got a bit annoying. Um, so, as far as all of that stuff is concerned, it's nice that they moved many of the drops to be not nearby cliffs, uh, so that you'd accidentally shoot that guy off. Um, Alright, next, uh, Racks from Perfect Winds. Uh, you may have seen this already in several of these maps, but uh, Daedalus Racks got changed into a sort of perfect win currency, uh, where if you win with no incapacitations in San Bronza, you get your Daedalus Racks for uh, crafting your uh, uh, highest-end uh, craftables and things like that. Granted, the craftables themselves aren't insanely good or anything, but still, well, outside of the Daedalus gloves, those are just amazing. Um, but still, uh, it's great to uh, to have that as an option. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's nice to see perfect wins acknowledged in maps that uh, get this uh, potentially difficult, you know? Like, this particular team is just entirely made to scuff their way through and uh, print out relics and drops and things, um, while I go and uh, talk about random mechanics in the background. <laughs> But uh, uh, if you're playing manually, uh, it's nice to have that acknowledged, you know? All right, uh, Crystals got made into a currency. We already talked about that. Uh, charms. So charms are something that's been requested for a long time, uh, where people wanted the ability to go collect the cards that you didn't collect on the field. Uh, you would technically collect them as items and use them as buff items back in PSP, which is a kind of... To me, it's always been a little bit of a funny, hey, look, we did the thing you asked for. Wait, what do you mean that's not what you asked for kind of thing? <laughs> So you can use them for buffs, um, but you can't use them for the buffs that people were talking about. I mean, granted, stats were basically free in PSP, so, you know, treat that as you will, but it it, it was just kind of funny. Um, so, either way, stat charms uh, are something that uh, just allow you to fully customize your stats uh, towards the end of the game. Um, and, you know, just allows you to make uh, kind of intentionally overpowered units in one specific way or another. Just kind of push your hands on the dial and see what ends up coming out. Uh, this is how we have a near-invincible chicken that's going and just crushing stuff here. Everybody else on this team basically has nothing, but, you know. I wanted to make a really overpowered chicken. I wanted to see what would happen if we just dumped hundreds of charms into one chicken. Um, okay. Integrated elements instead of augments uh, for faster swaps. Uh, so, the augment system was well-intentioned, but weird. So, the thing with the augment system is that there were certain elements that were just better than others at certain things. So, for example, uh, with your endgame, uh, you know, endgame uh, longbows, crossbows, whatever else, they typically scaled well enough that if you had a weapon matching your element, you were all well and good to go. Did you feel a little bit pissed off uh, in those moments when you realized that, oh, you know, my the only water longbow that I have access to is the frickin' Centilodal's rib? Yeah, that might be a little bit annoying. <laughs> like, oh, I don't get one of these until way the hell later, huh? Um, also, wow. 
finally, some freaking drops here. Uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. I kind of wish I didn't lose several units on the way, but oh well. We're at least, uh, completing that collection log, as it were. It's kind of burning through our people. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and do more maps, I guess. Go on this way real quick. Uh, do they have exorcism on this team? I mean, maybe. I don't know. Probably. Let's go ahead and see if they survive, and that way we'll know. Alright, anyway, so int uh, integrated elements. Uh, basically, this means that if you picked the wrong element, you are not stuck. So they wanted to always have this thing where you would diversify your elements and stuff like that. So you would you would want to go and equip people to use different elements at once. Like, you'd see wizards coming in using multiple elements at once. Um, they would give each of them cool features, and they're like, look, maybe you want to dedicate, it, dedicate to more at once. But realistically, it was not optimal to do so. They finally, after several different attempts, created a system here where it actually makes sense to diversify... Oh, excuse me. To uh, diversify your elements, and to have people using weapons that are not of their personal element if they want to. This kind of benefits uh, in all directions, as it were. So it took them absolutely ages, but they finally got there. Um, so in the case of these... Uh, of these uh, different uh, elemental augments, it's nice to be able to just immediately switch rather than being like, well, I just spent six, seven hours grinding that one skill up, and it was the wrong one, and now I get a stuck all over again, and or use cheats, and it, like there, it's just a very disheartening feeling. Like anyone that's been that's played that version has probably run into that in some form or another before. Uh, like that's uh, those moments when you just realize, like, wow, they've been training for this entire entire playthrough for this one particular element. Man, I'm totally gonna find a uh, you know something that'll make their build work in the late game, right? And then they're just kind of stuck using Damascus weaponry forever because the only fire spear that you get is uh, going to be uh, a uh, late uh, late drop in Coda Four. <laughs> like, oh, that sucks, dude. <laughs> That's just cruel. <laughs> uh, anyway, th there's a reason that everybody just went divine on their fencers in that one. But uh, yeah, if you were a uh, if you were a fire dragoon in, or if you just a fire spear uh, user in general, you were. Uh, you were having a bit of a hard time in PSP. Because <laughs> literally the first fire spear, the first uh, elemental fire weapon that you could get a hold of was the uh, uh, was the uh, Volcadius, uh, which could get upgraded into the Ignis. But they were both the same drop. So you had to go through Code of Four. You had to go kill uh, friggin' Time Paradox Balzaphon over there. Or not Balzaphon. Uh, was it Balzaphon? Yeah, B Balzaphon to get a rare drop of his one sphere, and then take like a 20 to 30% uh, chance roll to go upgrade it into the Ignis. It's like, why? <laughs> why is it all the way back here? Anyway, very cruel stuff there. Uh, but moving on. Uh, so, Field Alchemy and Throne got merged for the best of both worlds. I mean, that one's pretty obvious. Field Alchemy, uh, One Vision made it work. Original system, kind of annoying. Um, the idea being that you would have to dedicate somebody to being an item specialist, so instead they just gave uh, dedicated item slots. Uh, throne weapons also uh, were something that... Uh, that were an idea of just essentially throwing money at a problem to uh, to make it disappear. Um, but the original shot system, for example, didn't even check its uh, proper elements. It didn't check its uh, its own skill. Um, the throwing weapons themselves were janky and difficult to use. Um, not to mention, in most cases, it was just kind of a complicated thing because somebody would look at all of these throwing weapons and they're just like, why would I spend this much money on a just standard attacking weapon? So it had no appeal there. So they just reworked it to be like, okay, just grenades. There's elemental grenades, they work right this time, they have interactions, they'll interact with the world and stuff like that too. They're not some weird, you know, like, pacifist flashbang type of situation for some reason. <laughs> um, and so yeah, uh, in general, personally, I feel like shots were the perfect way to, uh, uh, to kind of rework it uh, based off the way that they were doing stuff here. Like, I love the way that uh, One Vision did throwing things, but I just appreciate the elegance of looking at that whole mess and be like, no, just grenades, just do grenades. This is way too complicated for anyone to really understand. Okay, uh, next up, uh, buffs got buffed and monsters got to shine. We partially touched on this already, but many buffs uh, got a about 2.5 times uh, kind of strength multiplier applied to them. So, like, Breach uh, used to be about 15. Uh, I forget if it was 15 or 20, but now it's all the way up to 50. Um, fear is far more noticeable in this new context. You can really see it breaking defense, even though it's technically the same amount. Um, 
it, like it's just way more noticeable with how exaggerated numbers can get in this version. Um, stuff like um, like a breach with its 50% multiplier is pretty nuts as well. Uh, just debuffs getting access to guaranteed uh, uh, pluses and minuses now is really really effective considering how m in many cases your uh, uh, your buff items and things could just simply get wiped out of existence back in PSP because there were so many different stacks of passives. Um, so either way, it's nice. Um, so, like, for example, if a unit was running True Strike, your dodge would do nothing in PSP. Like, they, if they outranked you by more than one rank, uh, like, if they had True Strike that was one uh, rank above your own dodge, um, even if you applied the dodge buff, it might just literally do nothing. Uh, okay. Uh, so, shoes are available earlier. Uh, yeah, so shoe items are available in several castle fights, I believe starting in uh, Chapter 3. Uh, so you'll get a hold of your shoe items, which will just allow you to have more universal uh, uh, traversal there, which actually next on the list is the fact that they're innate. So if you equip a shoe item, uh, you will be able to uh, to just use it all the time. You don't have to activate it anymore. Again, many forget that about the PSP version. It was a weird quirk of that one. Uh, yeah, buff and debuff guarantees. I already started uh, covering that one, but, uh, you know, guaranteed 30% uh, hit odds from concentration, guaranteed 20% dodge odds from false strike and dodge. You can stack those, so at any point you can turn almost any unit uh, into having 60% accuracy. If you ever wanted to see more of your shield, uh, start uh, making use of your false strike cutlass uh, or your books uh, and or your lightning dragons, as well as uh, using jewels of the avatar. They are very effective tools. And there's something that you can potentially convince the AI to use as well. Like you'll notice I have two people running false strike cutlasses on this team here to make these uh, rando uh, endgame uh, strong enemies with all their breath moves occasionally miss. Alright, uh, weather is less annoying with its accuracy mechanics. Uh, this is very situational. So technically they do the same thing where they will universally decrease accuracy. Now, the thing is, uh, with uh, with the way that stuff worked back in VSP, because uh, the uh, the hit odds were already typically lower than the uh, uh, typically lower across the board, this meant that if a um, if let's say a unit was uh, was already uh, you know going to have a hard time landing a hit, if it started raining, they would basically have 25% chance to hit. Uh, I mean, granted, that's if they were from the front. If they were from the back, it might go up to 55%, but they would have bottomed out odds is the point. And there are several times throughout the game where there are rainy seasons. So if you, for example, accidentally start the game in one of those rainy seasons, you might potentially find yourself in a situation where you are just constantly struggling with even landing a single hit on your basic units. Uh, this is one of those reasons that people would regularly uh, actually use the, uh, the true hit abilities uh, and or would train their weapon skills to the point of constantly hitting anyway. So you basically went from this, uh, it was this old RPG thing of just going from I can't hit a dang thing to I hit all the time anyway. So they changed it to, again, be more of a universal system, where everybody, by default, will usually end up hitting, but if it starts raining, they typically will see about a 10 to 15% chance to hit. If those debuffs are applied, they will start seeing a 20% chance to uh, potentially miss, depending on how many stacks of it are applied. So you still have the evasion mechanic in there, but uh, if, for example, somebody's standing on bad footing, you'll notice that they're going to have a hard time hitting things. Uh, if you uh, see them standing in the rain, they're going to have a hard time hitting things. There is a more consistent application of those things instead of just your accuracy feeling like it's all over the place. Again, uh... The uh, how satisfying that particular mechanic is is going to depend entirely on how many ways there are to potentially counteract it. So, like in One Vision's case, if you were to run full accuracy gear, you probably would have a far easier time with that stuff. Um, back in the PSP version, you had the uh, kind of true hit abilities, but that always felt weird. Uh, and there still were cases where it might potentially get completely wiped out. Uh, either way, uh, there's a there's a bunch of different ways you could potentially uh, go and make that argument, but personally, I like the consistency that they did here, uh, because I like seeing things like footing actually matter, um, where standing next to a tile with bad footing is a solid way to uh, to play a defensive build. Um, anyway, like I just love to see those map interactions. All right, non-unique relics and uh, buffed relics. So relics across the board, or just endgame equipment, got buffed uh, pretty significantly in some cases. Um, but on top of that, uh, you have non-unique versions. So, like, let's say something like the Fafner used to be unique, and now you can get multiple copies if you want to, for example, dual-wield Fafners. Uh, or if you want to have dual, like, dual Erasians, or you want to have multiple units running Erasians, uh, or, you know, you wanted to, let's say, um, 
uh, use something like uh, like the Leskers on multiple units or uh, or stuff like that. There are still things that are unique, uh, like for example the um, uh, what's it? Uh, da, 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 uh, what am I blanking on here? Stinky set. There we go. So, like, stinky set remains unique. Uh, the ogre set remains unique. Uh, but uh, for the stuff that uh, that you could do more stuff with, uh, like, for example, the evil deed set, you can run an entire team of evil deeds if you want to. Um, and, yeah, it's all perfectly viable. They come in with uh, all of the important stats and, uh, you know, attack penetration and stuff like that uh, at a set value right from the start. But it's how much they can scale that uh, that's actually affected by the relic status. So the more you combine, the better they get at that kind of stuff. And it just feels nice uh, to be able to use more of these items that were extremely limited back in the PSP version. So, either way, that stuff's nice. All right, uh, Farampa is an actual rookie area now. Uh, so this is, again, one of those ones that's going to make more sense if you played the original before, but uh, endgame for Rampa, uh, or not even endgame, but like the later parts of Farampa could get absolutely brutal for new players, um, where its whole purpose is just like, here's this, you know, kind of chilled out hunting ground for you to go and try out parties and maybe, you know, grind for craftables and go, you know, fight some different enemies and what have you. And then, uh, you, you know, you have those moments where you just walk into a fire and like, oh yeah, welcome to the uh, to ambush, uh, archer uh, and skeleton ambush hell, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that friggin' cliffside. Um, they reuse this one map uh, several times where there's this one fight in particular, the one where you end up um, uh, getting the Reaver Ring, if you know that it's there. Um, actually, no, is it that one? Yes, yes, it is that one. Um, and you have some pretty chill maps here and there, but in that particular one, you show up and they're like, okay, we have all of these ghosts with all of these debuffs all along this uh, this ridge up here. We have all these archers firing down at you. We have golems with uh, area denial all around the bottom. We have skeletons that are backing them up, and then we've got uh, even more uh, ranged units and warlocks in between. Just like petrifying units and <laughs> just annihilating everybody. Like, why is this one particular map so cruel? And what I love is that it's not that they got rid of that stuff entirely. They saved that for the uh, for the Heaven Generals. Because if you run into the Heaven General fight on that map, it'll 100% be the same experience. But when you go into Farampa, it is a chill place to go get your early game craftables. And, you know, for once, there's actually a reason to go upgrade your basic mage staff and stuff like that. Um, so, either way, it's just, it's just funny to see. Uh, okay, no level walls. So, I see people complain about the level cap. Uh, where were those people when there was the level wall? Uh... If you've never run into the level 30 uh, level wall, then, uh, you know, good for you. Uh, <laughs> there was a, a thing in PSP where technically you could overlevel to a certain extent. Many people would accidentally overlevel because it was very easy to do. And if you accidentally overleveled slightly too hard, uh, this could be anywhere from as low to, I think, uh, 24 was the lowest, uh, up until um, typically it was in the average around 30 or so you could very easily find yourself in a position where in the middle of, let's say, something like uh, San Bronza, there was just a massive uh, a massive jump and or a massive uh, kind of lowering of the level. Now, on the low end, this meant that you could potentially accidentally out-level the area by too far, and they will suddenly show up with equipment that you can't even touch. Uh, those were those cases where you're running mid-game equipment, and they're suddenly coming in equipped with, uh, with Dragon Scale stuff, and your weapons and skills and stuff literally cannot even penetrate their defense. Um, so that's fantastic when you're uh, on the very last uh, fight of Crit and I or something. Yes, I've had that happen before <laughs> with the uh, the spear only challenge I was doing like a decade ago now. Um, uh, and then at the same time, you had stuff like uh, San Bronza where you would get partway through, and if you got to uh, here, I think I actually even have the map uh, ne uh, showing up next here. Uh, but if you got partway through here, also I just noticed I I meant to say pinions earlier, not racks. Nah, whatever. Uh, where was it? Uh, not this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this map right here. If you shut up right here, this was where the level 40 wall started. Uh, did you not hit level 40 with all of your classes just yet? Um, well, it was nice knowing you. Now it's time to retreat, go get those levels, because you're probably not getting past there. <laughs> um, I, again, you know, barring some extreme cheese or what have you, but... It got to the point where literally I had a guy with, I think, like, rank 7 swords or something uh, that, uh, that was uh, running the uh, Lombardi and stuff like that, doing ones against golems. Like, it was so up and down and all over the place in that version, uh, where in so many cases it was just like, okay, take your guaranteed poison and just let the thing die. Just try to hold out, because <laughs> we're not fighting that fairly. Um, 
And it's funny because they have those same kinds of enemies in Reborn, but they're the neutral guys. They're the, uh, the yellow enemies that randomly show up in certain maps. And it's the same thing, that if you kill those guys in the same way, you get a bunch of, uh, a bunch of relics and things that you otherwise wouldn't have had access to. Um, so it's just nice to see that, you know, that they still technically have that idea there, but it's in a far more pleasant form. Because you don't have to fight those guys, and if you trick the AI into hitting them first, they'll just go and win the fight for you. Um, but in the uh, case of the original, yeah, it was just, here, here's an entire wall of those guys, figure it out. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, no New Game Plus surprises. This is part of that same thing I just mentioned, where in New Game Plus, uh, you could just accidentally r walk into New Game Plus on accident. That was super annoying. Uh, MP and TP uh, universal rules, uh, so basically everything that applies to MP also applies to TP and vice versa, uh, because the you know the systems got merged. So uh, the old uh, overdrive rules got combined, uh, stuff like, uh, uh, stuff like uh, spells that would previously hit one will hit the other now. It, it's just nice. Uh, the voice acting is kind of a given. All right, next up, uh, the background uh, tiles. Yes, I know. I just like one of the big changes they made in this one on the official side, and I've just gone ahead and glossed over it in a single line. Um, I like the voice acting. Uh, it wasn't really the make or break for me, but personally, I really love the uh, the emotion that it adds to scenes. So, like, I think it was a really solid improvement that they made there. It's no shock that that's what they went for. Um, like, they did a really good job on casting for the most part, uh, for, uh, for most of the people there. Um, again, it's not, like, universally perfect across the board or what have you, but it's, it is a really, uh, it, they overall did a pretty, uh, solid job. Um, alright, next, uh, background art from Tiles. You're not gonna see it on this particular map because we are currently floating through the frickin' sky, but I love that they took the time to redo the local area, uh, out of the in-game art assets, uh, for, uh, for pretty much every map in the game. It's just a really cool way to be like, hey, look, that's what you see outside your window, you know? Instead of just having the pretty background from PSP, just like, here you go, here's the greater outside world. You won't directly go to it, but, like, here's the uh, the docks that you know are going to be here from that cutscene from earlier and stuff, you know? Um, it's just nice to see, because most of those areas didn't have a fleshed-out in-game map before, and now they do. Kind of cool. All right, fast forward. That one's pretty obvious. There's a fast forward mode, and it's the right kind of fast forward mode where it makes the game itself play faster. Um, but you don't have to, uh, you don't specifically have to listen to the music sped up or have janky animations or what have you. You can also have the option for making it even faster by going and adjusting the uh, uh, the animation settings in the menu uh, to have shorter or longer animations. I kind of prefer having it on fast forward with the longer animations uh, because uh, Iron Maiden looks pretty uh, freaking cool when it happens. Uh, let's see, the H bar, HP bars always being on as well as elemental bars. Uh, again, self-explanatory, I like having the elemental bars. I like having HP bars up at all times. I spend a lot of time in the PSP version holding down the square button. So it's nice uh, to see that happen. All right, uh, the healing rework. Uh, so that's in, in uh, reference to the healing items because there was something like 20 plus uh, mend leaves or whatever else in the PSP version. Now most of them just scale. Uh, same thing for magic leaves. Uh, I love that. I love the way that they redid magic leaves, so that it gives you this hint of like you don't necessarily need uh, this item to succeed. You get your magic from other, or you get your MP from other sources. You know, you hit things, you get hit. You can serve your MP. You go and uh, collect your uh, your auto cards to make your uh, meditate roll more often. Like it just makes you play around the MP rather than just simply saying here's the one item to do it or here's the best in slot item to boost your MP. If folks were wondering why I was so uh, so adamant about people chilling out with the frickin' MP sticks uh, uh, when the game just launched, that would be why. Uh, because it was that same old MMO mentality of, like, I need my best in slot right now, there's no other way to play, I need to optimize my grind, and kind of, you know, bullshit. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, this is not that kind of game, it's a single... Like, it, it's supposed to be an immersive same kind of thing, you're supposed to explore the world and figure out the mechanics, not optimize everything until it sucks. What are you trying to do? Um, anyway, so I love that uh, the Magic Leaves got changed into this limited resource that uh, could be used for everything, so, like, you only get a handful of them, so maybe you go and give them to your dragon so they can open up with their Dragon Breath move, or maybe you go and give them to your casters so that they can start up, or maybe you'll uh, end up going and give them t giving them to your Dragon Slayers uh, so that they can go and focus up before they gotta go, you know, kill the thing. Um, so, either way, it's just a nice way that it's uh, kind of reworked, given a bit more value and all of that kind of thing. Um, Alright, finisher punishes and utility. So, when it comes to the finisher punishes, uh, 
I like again this is something I love because previously the elemental value on a finisher was just did you augment for that particular element if you did great if you didn't doesn't do anything for you um, so it's just a way to get a little bit of extra penetration in that version in this case it is a massive punish that anyone can utilize it gives you a reason to carry multiple weapons at once it gives you a reason to vary up your builds it makes like you can put any random just like completely random thing together you could play a randomizer in this game um, if, actually if somebody made it so that uh, there was a straight up randomizer for all equipment that would still adjust skills accordingly that would be amazing in this game it would actually work this time around um, that if they had a completely random selection of skills and equipment you would still have something functional coming out of almost everything um, there is an argument to be made for dang near everything I, again just just look like look at this right here uh, you'll still see arguments every now and then on somebody always needing a weapon skill. This again will be in the shield thing later, but look at this guy. His entire purpose is like, if, I mean, ideally he's built for playing manually, and ideally this hammer would be upgraded, but I don't have that right now. So he comes in, he opens in with a poison cloud, he has his concentration that makes that poison cloud work, he looks for dragons to kill because he only needs three pieces of dragon slayer equipment and th these pieces do the job. Um, and other than that, he's basically holding stuff in place, hitting with, uh, uh, with that dragon slayer, looking for that lament of the dead, and dropping debuffs. Like, as far as manual play goes, this guy is a freaking like, debuff god, and I love that. Um, but then I switch him over to automatic, and he is more of an effective uh, frontline dragon slayer kind of thing, you know? Uh, because just having those uh, those bonuses off of his weapon is enough to just completely replace his weapon skill for uh, for the purposes of a build like that. Um, so either way, that stuff feels wonderful. Um, uh, so just seeing more utility on finishers, seeing those options to tell your AI to just not use finishers or only use like a particular debuff variety is great for uh, for making your AI units. Uh, even if you're not you know making your whole AI grind situation like I am right now. Um, it creates a situation where you'll be able to make more use of these more niche mechanics to create this interesting automated uh, unit, you know? And I love building automated units. I love, like, Armored Core Formula Front or even the uh, the Verdict Day uh, uh, Unix system there. I love making an automated unit uh, that can support the rest of the team. I love this kind of stuff. Um, supposedly, that's actually a thing that Disgaea did at some point, and I mean to go explore that at some point, but either way. Only have enough time for certain things, you know? Alright, so heavy rolls are more defined, uh, that refers to the monster units who have a lot more utility currency of the auto skills this time around, uh, where the AI will be able to use them more effectively, you'll be able to use them more effectively, their overall roles are more clear, it's just like the Cyclops is the casty guy, but they are also a massive source of AoE stun, or the dragons are the more damage reflecty ones, or the chickens are the petrification ones, or the griffins are the uh, essentially medicine rescue squad as it were. Um, so that stuff feels awesome. Uh, unique levels, uh, having each unit level individually. Um, I Honestly, I could go both ways on either system. I, li I like them both for their different reasons, but uh, for the most part, this is a hell of a lot easier to understand. Um, your uniques actually come in trained in their weapon skills. Definitely very, very, uh, <laughs> very noticeable. Uh, like you, you uh, had this sort of a uh, second uh, playthrough syndrome that you saw. They saw back in uh, PSP, uh, where on the first playthrough somebody would get a unit. And they're like, "Oh man, this guy is so strong because of all these stats or what have you," and then you would go back and uh, see them a second time, and you know. Oh. Yeah. Good luck with that. Anyway, um, so as far as. Just as far as all these things are concerned, like when it comes to your uh, your uniques, uh, you would occasionally see them trained in really dumb ways, uh, or <laughs> or just ways that would completely not work. Uh, probably my favorite one is where in Chapter Three Neutral you can get access to Tammuz, uh, the uh, the unkillable knight, as it were, the guy with the coolest backstory and the most bizarre setup uh, when you end up getting a hold of him. Uh, because he's basically completely untrained, coming in with rank 1 swords and crossbows. So apparently the guy has been killed, or at least almost killed, multiple times. He has never once attacked a single thing. <laughs> and he comes in uh, rocking one of the only skirmisher builds in the entire game. Um, and aside from his ridiculously high vitality, uh, it would just take a really long time to get him up to par. Uh, or you would have cases of Olivia, who came in trained and resists silence. And comes in equipped with a hat that makes her immune to silence. The fuck is the point? 
So, <laughs> anyway, you had a lot of that kind of stuff. So, in this case, they come in, you know, courtesy of the new system, trained up, and uh, they actually make more sense. Like, when you see Tammuz show up, uh, you know, with his ranks and with his uh, sword and crossbow, it's like, wow, that's a build that can actually work. Good job, sir. Um, so, yeah, love that. Uh, heavies get access to items, so that's just a fantastic one to have. Uh, just being able to, for example, throw a bunch of medicine items on your griffin. Um, especially funny because I, when I when that realization hit, I was listening to uh, the uh, the griffin res, uh, res, uh, insurrection audiobooks, um, and uh, there was the whole mention of, uh, of medicine griffins, and that's why I've been uh, calling them that ever since. Of, uh, just like realizing that, oh wait, I keep rescuing people with griffins. That's exactly what these are. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Now, the auto skill system, I know people can take it or leave it. To me, I love this system. Just just because of how much it opens up, uh, the fact that you can, you know, go and do multiple things at one time, there is no optimization focus in terms of you have to activate this skill after this skill after this skill. You put them on the list, you can make it make them work on their own. They're either going to maybe do it, or they are guaranteed going to do it. Uh, whether or not uh, they work, uh, whether you need them all the time or some of the time, that's all you need to worry about, uh, and or the order that they activate in. You don't necessarily need to manually go and flick all the buttons makes stuff flow a lot better, and for for the folks that like to complain that uh, you didn't manually get to choose to activate that skill at that time, the fact that it's free, the fact that you're not taking any time to use it, uh, and the fact that, uh, uh, that you're able to stack multiple at once gives you a lot more uh, potential uh, kind of field viability for a lot of these things, uh, not to mention with how long these the play sessions for this game tend to go you'll oftentimes wind up in situations where you'll just completely forget uh, to activate certain skills. That's actually one of the reasons I believe that they had that uh, uh, exception to the chariot rule uh, that they actually changed uh, in this version. So the, there was a rule back in PSP uh, where if you hadn't ended your turn, you can still chariot back to your current turn and it wouldn't count as a chariot usage just in case you forgot to activate some of your skills. This time, because whether or not you activated your skills is actually part of the system, you no longer have that uh, that rule in that system in place. So the chess rule was uh, was changed so that you actually have a reason to go and you know either guarantee or don't guarantee your auto skills. I love that system because it allows you to use so many more skills at once, um, and it means that you don't have to go through several menus to be like, okay, I, I forgot to turn on my instill two turns ago, so now my next turn is going to be a little bit slower. Crap, that kind of stuff. Um, and yes, again, don't get me wrong, I love the stuff that One Vision did with it, because it's pretty cool to be able to go pickpocket somebody's MP and stuff like that, but for the purpose of the flow that they were going for here, I don't see any better way that they could have handled this. Alright, anyway, uh, next up, the skill stacks, which we just covered, and then Pumpkin Berserkers. Uh, the new spell slots uh, on the new UI, uh, just... Uh, to my mind, this is a pretty massive improvement. You don't have to specifically dedicate to one type of spells. Not to mention the limited number of spells makes you think about uh, how much something really needs to be permanently on your list. Um, the This is actually something that uh, Rakes had mentioned for One Vision as well, uh, that there were times that a lot of the designs that they had made for the mod uh, came from the fact that there were several skills that were kind of no-brainers. Just stuff that you'd never ever consider taking off, and that's one, one of the things that this game was built around. Um, just this idea of how much do you really need to permanently have on your list at any given time. Um, and it forces you to constantly reevaluate your builds and try out new stuff, and that's awesome! To me, that is a gigantic feature, so I love that. Uh, the autosave, uh, this one can be a give or a take, it's a little bit of a janky one, and it's basically the main reason we had so many crashes uh, when the game was first launching. Um, so, kind of, honestly, give or take in that one. Um, I personally like the fact that there's uh, one uh, mid-battle save, because again, it just forces you to commit. Uh, the more commitments uh, you have in a game like this, the better, as far as I'm concerned, uh, because, you know, it's a permanent world state and what have you. I would have loved to see a proper Iron Man mode, though. Um, I kind of wish that somebody would make a mod for that. There's not really much of a point. You can just play it without saving you know, or just you know reloading after you screw up. Um, it's not like something that's fully needed or whatever, but it would be cool to see more games have that. The only game of a similar type that I've seen that actually had it then in a form that I actually enjoyed it uh, was probably uh, something like uh, Pillars of Eternity. Um, there's, it's always either the game is too you know 
chaotic to necessarily make it work, or uh, or potentially would just uh, would uh, you know maybe not be fun under that rule set. It's very few that I've seen that actually can make both work. And I, I mean, I've done Iron Man runs of uh, of this one, or at least pseudo Iron Man runs. I'm pretty sure it is completely possible uh, from start to finish because it is consistent enough in its chaos to be uh, to be something that would work. Um, and then. Uh, Man, this is ta this is going on a while. Okay, I think I'm gonna actually have to uh, to do I cut it or do I keep going? Okay, we're gonna try to rapid fire the rest of these because I uh, I gotta start uh, getting more stuff done for the day. So okay, drop salad. There's more salads scattered about. More salads. There's more drops uh, scattered about all over the freaking map. Uh, so instead of being one specific drop from one specific guy in one specific room that maybe will show up once on a Tuesday every other month, uh, it is now going to be just drops all over the dang place. You get multiple of them, and they're all over the place. It's fantastic. Uh, next up, we have the uh, ranged uh, rework. Uh, essentially, uh, one of the problems that the series has had from the start uh, is that uh, certain ranged weapons, simply put, would... Um, would, uh, would end up eventually becoming overpowered because they are the thing that does not have any cost associated with it. So if you make it head hard enough, it ends up becoming a no-brainer, which is a bit of a problem. So, uh, the way that they uh, changed it is that it, uh, well, it's a more flexible formula this time around, where you need to look for defense breaks in order to, uh, in order to break through. Um, so, uh, so yeah, this, this means that, uh, for your ranged units, and you'll see this more during the ranged run, I have a, uh, a uh, few bits of that already recorded. I just haven't made all the other stuff for it yet because I haven't had time. Um, but uh, ranged uh, weapons are, in my opinion, a lot more satisfying to use here because they are no longer an easy win button. Uh, like, you can't just stack for anatomy, stack for crossbows, and then just basically ramble your way through the next hundred maps. Um, they specifically have to look for the right targets, you specifically want to try to break down defenses, and then once you do, the numbers are just a big ol' payoff. But, uh, you know, uh, it's just a fun way that they rework the system to make it so that it, it requires smarter use, you know? Uh, it makes you potentially rethink the uses of certain things, again, like this uh, Vartan setup here, which is essentially combining uh, the instill uh, uh, tick here, which actually, I'm going to throw this as an extra little quality of life feature. Uh, the instill tick happens at a different time. Where if, for example, you fire with a range unit in this particular context, if you hit it for, you know, if you fire and you do, uh, you end up uh, getting past defenses and you end up landing a crit and whatever else, and you do like 2,000 damage, your instill is going to come in with, I think it's like 500 extra damage in that particular instance, right? Um, back in the PSP version, if you hit for, like, let's say if you were normally shooting for 100 and you ended up critting for 150, you would still only get 25 extra damage because it's essentially calculating from your first calculation. Uh, uh, the instill this time happens later on, so that you get way more out of it. Uh, this is why the Barton is so good with Dragon Slayer, because it's essentially applying Dragon Slayer to its instill. So, that's really good. Uh, summons got fixed so that they actually work. Uh, summons back in the original were basically just an insta-kill. Uh, summons in the PSP version uh, were either an insta-kill or they completely bounced off armor. There were very few in-betweens, uh, so now they're fixed to be a consistent, like, threatening, but also potentially kind of dangerous ability. Uh, bosses will always spawn. Very annoying if anybody ever uh, was trying to farm uh, Tier 2 Apocryphas back in PSP. The bosses actually show up to their temples this time. What a, what a freaking thought. Uh, scaled poison is amazing. 10% is 10%. Card mechanics. Uh, so, personally, I love it. Um, as far as the card mechanics go, you already know how the card system works. Physical will improve your uh, uh, your uh, maximum hit. Uh, magical will improve your magic penetration. Uh, the uh, the skills will be the most common, uh, but it also causes you to uh, uh, causes you to uh, improve your skills and such. Um, the uh, crit cards will make you crit more often. You can still naturally crit. Uh, this actually is a nice little thing because you can intentionally make units that will be very unlikely to crit. For example, if you're looking to make recruiters, um, or if you're trying to use, uh, you know, charm bows and things like that, you can specifically have cases where you have a lighter touch and specifically avoid those crit cards. And personally, to me, that is additional flexibility in the system. Um, so either way, you have these additional buff mechanics. You don't necessarily need them, but they are a way to not only make the game a bit more chaotic, uh, but they are also a way to uh, allow you to get those big dopamine moments of like, hey, I just got like three fizzes and a crit, and I also went and got my uh, tremendous shot, double shot, like a uh, friggin' uh, uh, <laughs> you know, applied a dragon slayer on there, and there we go, it's time to break the, da the uh, damage cap several times over. It, it has the kind of this added benefit of making a lot of side grades to the system that are just interesting to play around. 
Okay, the boss advantage mechanic. Again, you see a lot of newer players complaining about this. I personally love it. Uh, the fact that bosses come in with advantages makes you think about stuff like weaken. You apply a weaken debuff to an advantaged boss, they're already going to be a lot less threatening to you. Um, so, again, very uh, potentially useful thing. Um, for folks that figured out how good debuffs can be, uh, this mechanic turned out to be fun. For those that didn't, they wound up being frustrating because they want to go friggin' honor duel the guy. Alright, uh, terrain interaction for cards and space. Uh, props used to be ding. Well, they were completely unbreakable back in SNES. They were partially breakable, but you pretty much never broke them in PSP unless there was just a massive spam of, uh, of like firestorms or something in a particular area. They had like 18 health. Now they have one. Uh, so it's a lot more, uh, a lot more feasible to break that box to actually go and open up a new lane on a map. Uh, the option to restart fights if you lost is very handy uh, for, you know, especially a lot of endgame areas. It's especially funny because those hidden bosses that I mentioned earlier will give you a different option if you lose to them, saying, would you like to restart versus a different opponent? Because you can only fight them once. Uh, next up, the free skills and cross-class elements. So cross-classing, uh, again, I know I repeat this a lot, but... Oftentimes misunderstood. Uh, Cross-classing in PSP was typically, hey, that guy has meditate, or that class can use meditate. You don't have meditate. Would you like to either kill somebody that has meditate and force feed their body to them, uh, or would you like to uh, spend a class mark to go switch them back and forth? Uh, there was nothing really terribly complicated about it. Now all of the usual kind of useful stuff everybody already has, um, and your cross-classing is more along the lines of using charms to switch elements that would otherwise be impossible for that class into other classes. Uh, for example, making a dark archer or some. Something like that. Uh, the original cross-classing mechanic is used in its en entirety for the Lord. Uh, personally, uh, going the kind of theorizing on how to shift certain elements onto other people is, to my mind, basically the same thing as just use the way that the cross-classing worked in PSP, but a bit more useful. Um, Honestly, I found that original mechanic a bit more frustrating than actually handy, but either way, to each their own. Uh, zombie recruitment, uh, we actually already covered that one. Apparently I put it on here twice. Uh, parry combination. So parry and deflect used to be two different skills. Now everybody not only uses them, not only is incapable of using them incorrectly, uh, but they're also uh, going to be combined, so you don't have to pick one and predict and hope for the best. Uh, uh, next one is uh, movement on items, uh, so Wade. Uh, so essentially your traversal options are far more open in this version. Uh, so you jump one tile higher, you move one tile farther, and you can move through the water. This completely changes the way that you approach certain maps. Uh, so for example, uh, the uh, the one fight uh, in Chapter 4 where you're going and fighting a wizard across the water. Uh, back in the PSP version, there was a non-zero chance you were circling through the entire map to get a hold of that guy. Uh, back in uh, SNES, you would just go through the water. In Reborn, you can also just go through the damn water. <laughs> So you just go up to the guy. It's like, yeah, the, your ambush sucks, dude. We can walk through the water. It's it's fine. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, racial bonuses actually matter. As you saw earlier, we're essentially using builds with racial bonuses on weapons. Uh, these are something that were technically a thing in SNES, but you'd never use. Uh, they were completely secondary uh, in um, uh, in uh, uh, PSP uh, because more than likely you would use the actual racial skill uh, as well as the uh, uh, as well as uh, your uh, your weapons uh, skill bonus in order to penetrate defenses at which point uh, the racial bonuses were very rarely actually going to be useful for you um, so it, it just was really unlikely. The fact that you were getting past defense uh, mattered a lot more than like that 5% bonus that you got. Uh, so there was almost no chance that somebody would actually end up realistically using them. Granted, in this system, there's basically no chance anyone's actually going to take advantage of that uh, uh, anti-golem bonus on a Damask Maze, but for everybody else, they actually are very useful this time around, especially on ranged weapons. Uh, they actually in effectively have replaced the original racial skills, and I love that, because those ones were very oddly specific. Uh, trajectory for free on everybody, that one's a given, you just see where you shoot stuff, it's useful. <laughs> Uh, finisher and spell crits. Uh, those could not crit before, and now the implications are amazing. Like going and firing a cyclone saber to go throw a guy off of a cliff uh, to go uh, hit uh, to go get hit by somebody else with a pincer attack. It's awesome. Um, actually, something like that right there, where he's able to uh, shoot in an AOE, potentially get some crits, and also get a uh, uh, get a uh, pincer on top of that. Uh, just, again, just a lot more flexibility and movement to all of it. Uh, Finisher's got new ranges. Again, this goes back to stuff like Cy Cyclone Saber and uh, Ruination in particular. Uh, Ruination allows you to use regular spear range uh, uh, early on while just being a faster option uh, uh, in the early game. Or, sorry, uh, use spear range later on uh, when you're forced into pikes. Um, I still would have liked to see variations on spear ranges, but it's kind of whatever on that. 
Uh, Cyclone Saber used to be one tile, now it's three. Uh, just generally gives you more options for some of those weapons. Uh, better finisher range uh, tolerance and rolls. Uh, so this would be stuff like um, uh, like the uh, what's it uh, the breach finisher on the spear, uh, where certain ones that will have certain animation types now consistently follow some of the rules that they started in PSP. So like uh, the uh, the breach finisher in particular attacks with an air attack, which typically would have more uh, uh, vertical tolerance, and now it does. Uh, so this means that you can attack at more awkward angles, like for example right here. You see where the Terra Knight is? If you wanted to attack that Angel Knight with that uh, particular spear finisher, he would not be able to back on PSP. He could in Reborn. Um, so these are, again, something oddly specific, kind of something that you'd feel out, but it's uh, noticeable if you've run into that before. All right, so no scrolls, but they got made into items. So scrolls, uh, that's more of a personal taste thing. I, it was a little bit of a silly uh, backup plan uh, back in PSP, but basically anybody could use any spell. They just ended up consuming the spell instead of, uh, instead of actually uh, casting it. This also meant that instead of going into the menu to learn a spell, the kind of optimal way to play is that every time you got a spell, you just used it for free in, uh, in that fight. Um, that being said, this also meant that you could potentially completely use the wrong spell on somebody and then just never be able to get it back. So, that being said, scrolls got replaced with equipable books again. It's just, for this system, it's just a better way to do it, frankly, especially with, uh, with people having uh, this potentially short of a shelf life sometimes. Um, but also, uh, you still have items that will make up some of their roles. Uh, so, for example, you would use uh, uh, somebody with spell strike, and then instead of bothering to go switch them to a different magic school, you would just use the scroll instead. Now you use the items for that instead. So instead of just going using Misery on somebody, you would end up going using uh, Brand of the Sacrifice instead. Uh, so shortcuts and secret hints. Uh, there's a lot of shortcuts uh, in the late game. Uh, these had zero hints in SNES and PSP. Now they will directly tell you, hey, this map has a uh, secret shortcut on it. Maybe you should look around. Um, Two-handed uh, weapons actually scale right. That one's it's funny because they technically have a different issue with them now. It's less of a problem. Uh, Two-handed weapons just had really crappy scaling back in PSP, and they basically were seemingly almost the same, uh, since they were mostly using stats back in SNES, so either way, two-handers actually work right. Um, recruit cost uh, got changed into something more reasonable, so you could use it as an actual uh, kind of combat mechanic there. Uh, music. The music got entirely changed. Uh, some are better, some are questionable, some are I don't know, but uh, in general, the soundtrack is pretty freaking awesome. Uh, auto poisons. Uh, so automatic uh, poisons and automatic uh, trick arrows on your ninjas are just awesome. Uh, the fact that you don't have to activate the buff means that they've got a lot more utility this time around, and you can potentially switch into different elements and even, or not elements, but different debuffs, and even play around that, and it's just a great way to do it. Uh, wider Lord. The Lord got chunky. He went to his Burger King, I guess. Um, but he, uh, he has access to way more than he used to before. He's no longer locked into the permanent Boy Scout build. Uh, personally, I used to, uh, to prefer uh, going with Dragoon rather than Lord just because of all the weird limitations it had. Um, uh, parry casters. Uh, casters get access to parrying daggers and uh, Kaldias and things like that, which have a parry effect on there. Uh, just gives them access to the parry skill. It's useful. Uh, Multi-crafting. You can do more than one craft at once. Uh, let's see. Uh, level cap over the gear cap. Uh, so gear used to have a uh, level cap associated with it, uh, and it was also very important for uh, improving your endgame units. Now you can just equip a gear at any level, um, and you're not suddenly running into awkward situations where you just can't use the upgrades that you want. Like, there were always these kind of awkward moments right before the next tier where stuff got weirdly more difficult. It just felt really inconsistent. Anyway, uh, tiered skills like Phalanx. Uh, so Phalanx starts off at 60, ends at 90. Uh, all those ranges being appropriate for their particular point in the game. Uh, very, 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 very potentially noticeable, uh, depending on what's going on. Uh, so, like, 90 percent reduction phalanx, uh, basically that was probably one of the biggest uh, killers uh, in uh, PSP, because somebody would end up, uh, let's say, getting knocked down on the ground, you have the means to revive them, you don't have any range extensions to go and uh, get them up on their feet, and then that knight moves forward with their Rampart Aura. They turn on their Phalanx. Their next turn is happening like half a frickin' year from now. And you have no way to fly over them. They basically just checkmated your unit to potentially a permanent death uh, because of that one uh, skill difference. Uh, whereas 60% uh, might be a bit more workable to work around in the early game. Um, <clears throat> 
Uh, and the fact that it's automatic means that uh, you potentially uh, could uh, could create a situation where you just disable it entirely by putting them to sleep. Um, so, either way, uh, it's uh, it's a system that allows for uh, for more forgiveness as far as those plays go. Okay, uh, transformations got reworked. There's actually a reason to use the Ogre Blade this time around. There's actually a reason. You don't have to uh, uh, go through four separate maps to go transform somebody into an Angel Knight. My god, that was tedious before. Um, uh, Ogre Blade options. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, the Ogre Blade specifically, there's actually more of a reason to, uh, to use it here. Um, Actually, one more thing, the uh, uh, the Ring of the Dead, uh, it no longer works on one single floor in Palace of the Dead. I don't know why that was ever a mechanic. Um, uh, but the Ogre Blade uh, will now transfer skills from the user into the new class, allowing you to kind of create your own custom classes. Dragon Slayer uh, set access got improved across the board. Uh, the uh, the uh, skills uh, on the tamers, uh, the evasion skills, uh, previously were way too expensive. Now there's something that you can basically use to uh, very effectively tank things. Uh, so that's really useful there. Uh, spell ranges got improved across the board. You can even customize for having that extra five range off the of staff. Uh, pincer and auto implications, uh, just in general, the, the sheer amount of ways that you could use both uh, pincers and the auto skills really, really, really opened up the system. Um, there's too many ways to go into, I mean, just look into the tons of videos uh, through the Know Your Unit series over how many ways you can use your auto skills. Um, even something like using Phalanx to make a self-destructing, uh, you know, Grenadier and stuff like that, uh, where they're... Oh, whoops. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, where their 90% reduction thing means that they can also use grenades like that, you know? Uh, new skills got added, like a, like a Fall Blade and uh, uh, Quick Draw and stuff like that, uh, just to replace uh, stuff that technically would have actually been removed by the system. Uh, scaled Weapon Ranks. Uh, so the Weapon Ranks uh, will mean that uh, your shots will uh, essentially... Uh, your Weapon Skill doubles as your Throne Skill this time around. Um, and additionally, uh, the actual defensive bonus from the original Weapon Skills still do apply. Uh, so, for example, if you were looking to defend against a particular weapon... Oh, whoops. Apparently, dying happened. Let's go ahead and restart that fight. Yeah, th by this point in San Bronza, you don't want to be autoing it. <laughs> Here, let's go ahead and uh, restart uh, that one real quick. Man, this particular one has taken so many casualties that it's not even funny. It also probably doesn't help that I'm throwing very random people into here, but... Oh, well, you know, it is, uh, it is how it is, I suppose. Here, let's see. Uh, why don't we... Yeah, let's go ahead and throw this guy in. He's going to die pretty much immediately. Um, okay. So, uh, the uh, the AI, despite occasional comments to the contrary, did actually get improved in terms of its overall functions. They understand how to squat up better. They know how to, how to position better. They understand strengths and weaknesses a bit better, which also makes them more predictable in some situations, which is fun for messing with bosses. For example, you know that a fire boss is always going to chase down that ice unit, but that also means that you can have that ice unit backed up by a beast tamer. Throw a weaken and a breach on that guy, and you know exactly where they're going to attack. Let's say you turn that guy into a um, uh, turn that guy into a swordmaster. You turn their backup into a a um, uh, something like a Terranite. The Terranite leeches MP off of that boss uh, with their uh, their MP drain. Uh, they then uh, essentially put all those uh, uh, they had already put those debuffs on this guy, and at that point uh, the guy that originally would have had a weakness versus this boss is able to consistently outfight him with preempt, uh, just because he's always taking those basic attacks, he's getting his MP leeched away, um, and at the same time, uh, you know, essentially he's just able to attack more uh, more and more and more uh, with those debuffs, uh, overcoming any disadvantage that they had originally. You know, cards or no cards, it's just, it's a system that allows you to twist things around more. Um, but either way, this AI will consistently try to get their elemental advantages and things, um, so... Anyway, as, as with always, there's always going to be more misunderstandings. This is why you'll often see misunderstandings about, oh, the AI is just, uh, you know, always uh, permanently stronger than I am. They hit so much harder than I do. It's because they're using their advantages. Um, okay, uh, Songstress has instrument slots. Uh, that, that means that they can use their uh, songs at the start of a fight. Makes them really good as a uh, startup buffer. Um, Semi-unique, uh, generic shinies, uh, just means that there's unique uh, variants of particular units, like the Dark Griffin, the uh, the Evil Chicken, the Ice Lich, and what have you. It's just fun to go collect those. Um, apparently there's a uh, Divine Lamia somewhere. I haven't found them yet, but somewhere up here. This is what I was originally doing on this map. Um, 
the post game is an actual challenge. Uh, if you do, if you achieve rank eight, so you could basically curb stomp uh, the original. Um, like it was just basically long range, uh, just deleting everything before it could touch you. Uh, easy or hard mode, um, basically it just depends entirely on how you want to uh, uh, how you want to play things. Um, Basically, if you want to pay attention to your elemental advantages and stuff like that, you're going to have a far easier time. If you want to have an instant hard mode, just go ahead and turn off your elemental bars and hope for the best. Um, scout mode. Being able to actually scout out maps ahead of time is a pretty massive deal. Can you tell I made this list in a random order? Being able to rename your units is pretty fantastic. Fixing the post-game tiles. Uh, there were a lot of tiles in San Bronza. I believe, actually, this was one of them, if I'm not mistaken. Uh... Like right over here, I believe, was uh, where one of them was. Uh, that certain tiles just weren't layered right in the post game. Uh, so when they were going through and uh, kind of uprising all of these maps and whatnot, uh, that's one of the things that they ended up improving. Uh, the uh, select tip. Uh, so instead of waiting for something to scroll, uh, you can uh, just hit the uh, select tool tip to instantly see all of the text on one of those things. Uh, if you were ever curious when playing One Vision why it gave you all of the information in brackets at the very start, uh, it's because. Uh, he wanted to implement something similar to that uh, back in that version. Uh, so essentially, select will do the same thing. Um, uh, faster animation options if you want them. Uh, the push rule got changed. Uh, I was mentioning this in the shield video too, uh, but you can actually push heavies back. But additionally, if units are on wet footing, like in water and whatnot, um, they, uh, they can't actually be pushed back if their uh, feet are stuck in the ground, which is just kind of a neat change. I don't know the full extent of that yet. I've tested it a few times. It could be as simple as just random chance. I don't know. But uh, so far, it seems to be that uh, wet footing and or muddy footing uh, causes you to have a lower chance to be pushed back. Um, uh, let's see, uh, precise MP pacing. Uh, this basically means that uh, your MP will keep going at a specific rhythm. Um, uh, and additionally, when it comes to your... Um, well, it's not that it didn't go at a specific rhythm before, but uh, your MP bar affected things before. So if, for example, bosses came in with ridiculously high MP bars, they got way more MP. This time around, they're just like, okay, everything is consistent, but your MP, uh, your boss just comes in with an MP card. It's more understandable. Um, it's like you immediately get the idea of what they're going for. Um, basically, same effect, more obvious to the uh, player, as it were. Uh, okay, white dragons. Uh, so this is going to be uh, when it comes to your... Uh, uh, your loot dragons and things like that, uh, so... Oh, no, 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 uh, no, no, this is, um, what's it? Uh, what's your face? Uh, Oshon, uh, Oshon's dragons. So, Oshon, uh, previously would just leave her dragon behind, uh, now she'll, uh, join with her dragon. So, uh, so that's a thing. Um, but that being said, also, the neutral dragons are just a fun addition, uh, where the first one is just there to kind of teach you that, hey, these are a thing, but everyone after that will give you, uh, some kind of, uh, unique, uh, not really necessarily unique, but they they have a high chance of dropping relics. Um, instant revives, giving you a turn immediately upon starting up, uh, or getting up on your feet. Everybody get access to Wade. Uh, this is a massive thing, uh, starting in, like, in the early parts of the game, they don't all go in the water, you do. But as the game progresses, everybody gets the option to go in the water, which really uh, kind of uh, opens up uh, opens up all of these maps that were originally designed around that concept. Um, again, they tried to get it way more strict with it in the PSP version. It's interesting there, but uh, having access to the water uh, for everybody really opens stuff up. Um, and then uh, uh, the pl okay. We're going to end this on an extremely oddly specific one that few will understand what I'm talking about. Um, the, uh, the plus 10 knockback damage. Why so small of a thing? Why does it matter? Because your damage can vary slightly up or down. Um, and specifically, if you're trying to play without uh, the chariot system, you're going to be looking at a system where you're potentially looking at a shot where it's going to specifically be like exactly enough damage to kill something, right? If that damage goes up or down slightly, you're screwed. But in the case of the uh, uh, in the case of that plus ten damage, what it creates is a situation where if you angle it right, you can still guarantee that kill. If you can make sure that they knock into something, you are one hundred percent guaranteed to avoid the highs and lows of your particular attack. Again, very oddly specific, but one of very many tiny changes that they had made here. Okay, so my voice is friggin' giving the hell in, uh, hell out right now. Um, that is like the first 105 things that came to mind. Um, you know, I'm sure there's more on there, but uh, I know if I start redoing the list, I'll just start doubling up on stuff and whatever on accident. 
but hopefully you get the general idea. It's more than just a few simple quality of life changes that they made in this one. Um, so, uh, so yeah. Um, that's, that's kind of about that. Uh, thank you for sticking by this insanely long ramble. Uh, hopefully you get the idea. I will do one of these for uh, One Vision as well, um, because uh, currently I'm, again, doing my full catcher playthrough, because I want to do all of the... Uh, ow, what the hell? <sighs> How did you get in here? There's just... <sighs> There's always something. Somehow, a stink bug got in, the, uh, got in our uh, hobby room here and just hit me in the frickin' face. It's just rude. Anyway, so I plan to, plan to finish that uh, that full uh, you know catch up uh, playthrough to figure out what's actually been new in different patches for One Vision. Do all of those uh, know your units uh, for One Vision, and additionally want to do this like hundred plus uh, quality of life improvements that uh, One Vision made. Um, because yeah, that's uh, make no mistake, that is a freaking biblically long list. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that will be about it. Actually. Isn't the change log like 60 pages long for One Vision at this point? I should just read that. That would be way easier. Anyway, I gotta get back to it. Uh, I got the stuff to get done. So y'all have yourselves a good one. Um, take care, and thank you for stopping by. Later.